Good morning, folks. So I saw a most interesting bug this morning. Um, took, uh, I guess, an hour to figure out what it was. And the symptom was that the motor, the motor had a, an effective control range for C of T from zero C of T up to 100 out of 40,000. I think it was something like that. And the entire, the entire control range for C of T was zero to 100 instead of zero to 40,000. So the first thing that occurs is, of course, something wrong with the scaling in the software, a floating to integer conversion or conversion or integer to float conversion or something. Go through the software, the software is all fine. Go through all the circuitry, all the, the pulse widths, inputs and outputs look right, except that the motor is running almost full speed when the PW out output is like at 1%. So, then we started looking at the hardware and it turned out that that resistor, instead of being 10K, was one meg, which set the turnoff time constant for the field effect transistor 100 times as big. And so it never turned off. Once it made threshold at all, it never turned off. Yeah, that's a great thing about these projects. Another hour of our lives lost. <coughs> I, it was, that's interesting. I, I haven't seen that one before. So that might get the bug of the year so far. That's uh, a, bad, a bad resistor value that looks like a software misscaling. Jeez. Any other questions about Lab 4? Any, any obscurities that you've seen? <clears throat> I'm trying to think up a replacement lab for Lab 4 for next year. So this, I've been using this for a while, and experience shows when you use a lab for a while, it, it gets musty, and, uh, and code starts floating around and various other things. So what would be a good replacement lab for this? One, re one thing I like about this lab a lot is that there's high level signals, the, the PWM switches and the SPI clocks, and then there's these low level sensor signals which are susceptible to EMI from the high level signals. And so the physical layout of the circuit matters and it, that'd be kind of nice to maintain because you, you're so used to working with digital signals where everything's exact it does it, it you need to see some analog noise so but trying to th I mean, there's all kinds of other constraints on lab for this course with a hundred people I need about 30 to 40 copies of whatever it is I'm gonna build which means it can't be a, on a robot arm this big because it would take a room this big to store them all so it's got to be little so it's got size matters it's got to be a small thing it's got to be something I can teach in about two weeks. It's got to be less than, say, $100 a station. And it's got to be maintainable and easily fixable. With those constraints, any ideas? You're smacking him like he had an idea. Pardon me? OK, all right. <laughs> so, so the one thing I've come up with so far is you take a stick, cheap, easy, put a quadcopter motor on the end and the ubiquitous fan blade, and then at this end you put a potentiometer to measure the angle. And then maybe a counterweight over here if the fan's not strong enough to actually lift this. So there might be a little counterweight over here. And then you ask the student to have this hover at 90 degrees. So if you turn off the fan, it goes clunk and falls to the table. And you, you write the control sequence so that, so that the fan hovers. 
under the angle control of the potentiometer. No accelerometers, those are too easy. So you build, have to build your own, you have to build your own tilt meter here, essentially. So you take this apart, you're left with a stick and a potentiometer. I can stick, I can put 30 of those in a drawer and save them until next year and that works out. The, what, so the size is right, the cost is right. One of the downsizes is, now, sides is, now you have a, a, a fairly powerful little motor with a fan on top spinning right at eye level. What could go wrong? Do we have to have safety glasses now for everybody in the lab? What happens if you lean over and catch your hair in it or, or the sleeve of your, of your coat or something? What happens? You have to put a protection thing around there. I don't know yet. Has anybody caught any part of their body in any of the fans this year? Yeah, what'd you get? Finger? Did it cut you? Good. But, but the, well, somebody blew a, a blade off a fan. Was that your finger that did that? It was what? Hit the fan, knocked it over, and the blade flew off. I'm, I'm happy you weren't hurt. So, any other ideas? Anything you think would be fun to do? Tell me about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a new lab. And the, the, the default is put a DC motor on the table paint half the shaft white, make the shaft run at constant velocity. That's boring. I mean, it's more fun to have something that moves around. So think about it. See if you have any cool ideas. Last thing is I found a, a micro stick this morning with the CPU pulled out. I'm guessing it's because there were no more CPUs in the lab. Is that true? Anybody know? I don't care about that, but if we run out of something, put a message on Piazza to me, because as much as I like to pretend, I, I, I can't read your minds. So, so if we run out of some kind of resistor, or there's a capacitor that seems to be low or that you need, give me a message and I'll order them up. Otherwise, I don't know they're gone until I try and find one a week later. So. So don't hesitate to give me messages about lab stock, either in email or on Piazza. So I did attempt to put together at least a little summary of power management and I can't find all of the pieces. This is a complicated subject. There's a lot of information about it in reference the reference manual chapter 10 power saving modes. In data sheet section 25 power saving features and in PLIB section 10 where there are precisely two macros with no parameters and they're, they're therefore essentially useless. Pa set the uh, power save mode to idle and sleep. <coughs> and I'll tell you in a few minutes the, the piece I found unsatisfying. There's lots of pieces. But the reason this is so complicated is that every single peripheral on the chip has its own power down protocol. Timers behave differently than the analog to digital converter which behave differently than the watchdog timer. And so information about the power down modes for peripherals is scattered through every chapter of the reference manual. Oh man, that is horrible. Thousand pages of fun. 
and so there's some general guidelines you can get from the power saving features for the, from the from the features section and the saving modes section but there's a lot of reading to do to just decide how you're going to handle the peripherals if you want to get truly low power. Why do you want to get truly low power? Well, let's say that you want to you want to build a little data logger that you drive along, you throw out the windows of the car, and it bounces along the ground and gets some solar power, and it sits there and it uploads data every once in a while to to the satellite or the Red Rover or whatever's around, and if you want to do that with a couple of A cells, it's really nice. I mean, there's a group doing this now with uh, rain, rain, uh, rainfall data. It's really nice if, with a, with a low bandwidth system like rainfall, if you can put the CPU to sleep for 9 minutes and 90 and, and, and 59 seconds out of every 10 minutes, wake up for one second, check the rain gauge, send a burst of data up, if necessary, go back to sleep again. Because in, because, and the reason this is effective is that when you're not clocking a CMOS circuit, it draws hardly any power. It draws very close to zero power. Almost all of the power is dynamic power. Except for the I.O. pins. And so you can save orders of magnitude in current if you turn off all of the clocks. Which, by the way, is the same as sleep mode here. The summary is that idle mode disables the CPU, but leaves all of the other peripherals running, and it leaves all of the clocks running. But if you put it to sleep, then only static stuff is still executing. So, what are the static functions that are available on, on a CPU. Oh, it can detect the level on an I.O. pin and maybe one or two other things, but that's about it. So you want to do power management whenever you're running off of batteries or operating in any other power limited environment. And so it's important to figure out all of the ins and outs if only you can. The, the, the really basic feature is, and this is obviously right out of the data sheet, is that since all the power is dynamic power, if you slow down the CPU from 40 megahertz to 30 to 20 to 10 to 4 megahertz, the current in the CPU scales exactly linearly. So that you can drop the power required from 20 milliamps down to 2 milliamps by dropping a factor of 10 in frequency. If you go to the low power RC oscillator, which is 31 kilohertz, kilohertz, now you're down to 100 microamps. And this is with the CPU running. So this is, this is full operational mode, but just very low clock rate. with the peripherals shut down. So nothing's running on. No timers, no analog to digital converter, no nothing, just the CPU. And the number of notes on this was fantastic, so I left them in here. There's just a whole bunch of caveats about how this was tested. And you can be sure that the test conditions that they chose were the lowest power test conditions. In particular, USB has the ability to override all of the power off and turn the power back on. If USB wants power, it gets power and turns the CPU back on. If we do go to idle mode, then dropping into idle mode lowers the power quite considerably and, and you do this with the save idle, uh, power save idle uh, call. The clock is, all the clocks are running normally. 
peripherals are can be turned on uh, the table the next table shows the power with all of the peripherals turned off so it's not clear exactly what's running except the master clock and and here's where it gets tricky peripherals can be individually configured to halt automatically if you if you enable their SIDL bit oh god so every different peripheral has a SIDL bit in a different register somewhere so the only way to find those is to go through the to go through the hardware manual to find them so for example what should the timer do in idle mode should it keep running or should it not well you have your choice if you if you set the SIDL bit it stops if you leave the SDL bit SDIL bit clear then the timers keep running and keep good time because because idle mode merely disables the CPU and doesn't disable the clock you can start the CPU rather quickly again once you go out come out of idle mode probably within two cycles this is not true of sleep mode in sleep mode you turn off the oscillators these oscillators are, are highly resonant systems they're 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 oscill I mean they're oscillators right they're highly they have a high gain that means that they build up energy over many cycles that means that the turn on time for the oscillator can be as much as a few milliseconds so they're rather slow starting but coming out of idle mode is fast how do you get out of idle mode how do you get out of idle mode you take an interrupt which is enabled and the priority of the interrupt has to be greater than the pr priority of the CPU. The CPU has a priority? Golly, I didn't know that. So you can decide whether a given interrupt is going to wake up the CPU or not. Any form of system reset, of course, takes it out of power save mode. And uh, a watchdog timer timeout can take it out of uh, idle mode. You know what you know what watchdog timer is for do you know that it's a it's a timer which is very hard to start or stop but if it times out it forces a reset on the CPU this is so if you have code gone wild you can you can bring the CPU back to a known state in a way that is hard to disable the the power characteristics for idle current so this is CPU turned off, clock turned on, is not that much better. So if we look at 40 megahertz, it's 7.5 mils. It was 20 mils with the CPU operating. It's 7.5 mils with the CPU not operating and no peripherals running. doesn't drop much with the low power RC oscillator it's still about 100 microamps at 4 megahertz it only drops a factor of 2 at 40 megahertz it drops a factor of about two and a half or three so that's not very impressive you're still drawing milliamps of current if you want to have any kind of battery life you have to get down into the microamp range which means you have to go to sleep mode in sleep mode system is off sys clock is not running any peripherals that operate from sys clock through through the peripheral bus are all turned off everything is static memory memory stays registers all stay everything is static there's a significant wake up delay some can continue to operate in in uh, sleep mode particularly anything that operates from timer one which can be set to operate off of an external low power crystal 
like a 32 kilohertz crystal. The ADC can also operate under some circumstances. The UART is watching its port. It's not doing anything, but it's watching its port in case a, a character comes in. And the watchdog timer is, can tick away also. But, <clears throat> and most importantly, I.O. pins continue to sync or source current in the same manner as they do when the, when the system is active. That means that if you have a, a 1K resistor hooked to a pin that is high and you put the system to sleep, that 1K resistor is still going to draw 3 mils. And so you don't get low power if you're drawing current from the I.O. pins to get, so what do you do? You turn them all into inputs. You float them, in other words. You turn them to inputs and float them high. And, and oh, turn on a pull-up resistor internally. And that, that puts you in a fairly low current mode for I.O. pins. The pin change interrupts still operate, however. If, they're configured, if a pin is configured as an input, the clocks are off, a pin change occurs, and the pin change interrupt has a higher priority than the current CPU priority, then a change on any pin will bring the system out of sleep. That's how you wake up, by an external event. <clears throat> Interestingly, if If the, an interrupt occurs which has a priority lower than the CPU priority and the system is in sleep mode, then the system bumps up to idle mode. So that the next interrupt is interrupting it from idle mode rather than sleep mode, which has a different behavior. In power down, in power down mode, no clocks are specified because no clocks are running. At 25C, the typical current now is 44 microamps. Now that's a significant saving. Now we're talking low power. So if you have a couple of A cells that are good for half a, about one amp hour, how long 44 microamps you can run for uh, 25,000 hours. That's getting significant. Again, this is with no peripherals running. So the, the thing which occurred to me is, okay, I need a list now of how much current each peripheral draws. I can't find it. Yes? What are these temperature values? That's the, that's the uh, temperature of the, of the die. So the leakage current goes up with temperature, and so the, 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 the current goes up. The only differential currents I could find that were per peripheral were these three right here in this table. No place else is there a, more, uh, a better list. The, watch, the timer, uh, watchdog timer takes 25 microamps. Uh, the real-time clock at 32 kilohertz takes 23 microamps. And the ADC, if you leave it on, takes a whole milliamp. So the, the ADC is expensive in power down mode. It would really be nice to know what the other timers take. I couldn't find it. I, I searched for three hours this morning. And that's why I love the microchip site. But I think what you'd have to do is to experimentally put an amp meter in the power supply line and see how much it's, it's, it's running. Now, <clears throat> not only are there SDIL, SIDL bits for each peripheral which can force the peripheral into sleep when you put the CPU into idle mode, you can turn off individual peripherals 
hard turn them off so that they never operate and save some power and there's a separate control register for then there they are a separate control register for each peripheral ADC CTMU comparator voltage reference all the comparators all the input captures each one of them has a PMD bit a PMD register and bit which turns off its power this is different than enabling the peripheral by turning it on when you open it when you turn it when you open a peripheral you'll probably remember from the captures that you say capture one on capture three on timer one on that's an enable bit which is different than this power down bit interestingly if you power down an enabled an enabled peripheral the results are indeterminate they're not documented lovely so if you're going to turn off a peripheral disable it first also when you do this the control registers that that operate the peripheral become unreadable and unwritable so the memory map corresponding to the register also becomes unreachable undefined behavior oh yes of course to disable a peripheral you have to set the bit to one uh, okay and <clears throat> and in normal op oh yes the PMD re this really this is these are few, there's a few things on the CPU that should be hard to change during normal operation turning off peripher peripherals should be hard you don't want a soft error you don't want a cosmic ray strike to turn off your timer you don't want a soft error to change your CPU execution rate those are pretty basic kinds of things so there is a special unlock sequence you've got to do on these PMD registers before you can touch them so you have to do the unlock unlock procedure and then relock them afterwards and I'm not going to go through that there's a couple of of just appear to be random numbers you have to write to a certain 32-bit register to make that work <clears throat> and then you can change them then you need to lock them again but there's also a mode you can put the system into which allows you to change the values once before you reset it again so you put it in change once mode you change the registers when you lock them again you can no longer unlock them so there's a double safety here that not only do you have to unlock them you can't that's a lovely list so I did a bunch of ooh. this is not quite the current version let me try and force a reload here well, maybe I didn't save that one um, so the process is going to be non-trivial to get to a low power state probably what you're going to do if you really want to go absolutely dead low power is you're going to write a header file and I had one link at the end of this which apparently I didn't save from Dreamweaver so I don't have it live but it it's written that has a header which disables all the peripherals for you so then you could comment out one line of that if you want to say leave one timer running or the ADC 
and you can be sure that everything else has been powered down and that you're therefore into the lowest power configuration you can manage which is compatible with what with your application otherwise you would you would effectively copy paste this this peripheral uh, disable table into a header to to disable everything so you'd probably start out by disabling the peripherals you didn't care about then you have to do a timing analysis and figure out just how slow you can actually run the clock well, I mean, running at 50 megahertz is really nice it's easy you could do floating point you can do all kinds of arithmetic but maybe you don't really don't need that maybe you can go to 4 megahertz or 2 megahertz and sure the latency goes up a little bit <coughs> for certain operations but it might not matter so now you have to do a ser serious clock analysis and figure out what you actually need once you do that then you have to then you have to do an analysis to figure out what kind of duty cycle do you need for actual operations can the system sleep 90 percent of the time 99 percent of the time you have to decide what kind of low power event is going to wake the system up for example I have a MNG project now which a friend of mine suggested uh, it's a toilet seat monitor and he, he referred to it as gee whiz and and the idea is that when you raise the toilet seat it gives you a 30 second or 90 second warning before it starts yelling at you to put the toilet seat back down again okay various households that's a good idea like mine and so um, we thought okay we'll put an accelerometer uh, use a use a 8-bit microcontroller a little tiny 8-bit microcontroller 8 lead microcontroller running at extremely low frequency put it to sleep how are we going to wake it up oh we could get an accelerometer the accelerometer could pull an interrupt line uh, we could probably get it down to a few microamps that way but wait you're going from 0 degrees to 90 degrees why not just use a steel ball tilt switch it's got a ball in it that rolls from one end of the thing to the other the ball rolls down bounces off the contacts and turns on the power it's got no microamps of rusting current like zero and you can't do better than that so we're going with the peripheral which is the switch the the tilt switch uh, orientation of uh, orientation sensitive on off switch to power the system because it'll have essentially an infinite battery life as long as the toilet seat is down so you have to then decide as I said you have to decide what kind of event you're going to wake up the system with or power the system with in this case we're just powering it down but we could have run an external interrupt with that also so you could leave the system under power the system the the AT tiny 24 that we're using I think draws two microamps when it's uh, sleeping we could just have that ball hit hit an external interrupt line wake the system up again so I don't know which way will be more effective but in any case it'll only be a microamp or two that's being drawn so <clears throat> you turn off the peripherals you set the clock to the lowest you can based upon an analysis of actual performance you decide how you're gonna what kind of sleep mode you can afford and then how you're gonna bring the system back out of sleep when you need to and then you can start getting the the current levels down to something that allows battery power over a, a year say <clears throat> these systems are pretty nice they do pretty well on on they, they don't have a long boot sequence 
there's no there's no penalty to just turning off the power except you lose data it is possible to save data through a through a power out on these by writing where writing a, a piece of flash so it is possible to, to save data and then power the system down you can also use external flash RAM to do that and then there's no particular reason not to just turn it off so any questions about this I don't even know how to write a lab for this it would be interesting to try and do a low power lab I don't even know what it would be because there's so many aspects to, to this process everything interacts with everything through the power system and so you're gonna you have to think in a fairly strategic fashion to figure out how you're gonna minimize power thinking at every level from the organization of the of the application down to the details of the peripherals could you get away with a real-time clock do you really need to run timer 3 at all could you just run off of the 32 kilohertz crystal running low power oscillator there's lots of aspects to it So, final projects start yesterday. The first parts are here today from the orders on Monday. Not all of them are here yet as of at least 10 o'clock this morning. I expect we'll get a few more today. Probably the ones from DigiKey will come today. At least I hope they will. And uh, so final projects are underway. You are expected to be in all of the labs. You can work outside of lab, but I want to see you every week. And there's a really good reason for that. And that is, as I think I've said before, It's much easier to prove you're working if the boss sees you working. And there's a, there's a backup aspect to this that if the system blows apart and, and, and springs come out in every direction on the last day before your demo, and you've been working hard through, and I can verify that you've been working hard, you're not going to lose much. If I if if you come in if you I haven't seen you all for five weeks and you come in you have the smoking remo remains of something, how do I know what you've done? Show up every week. Show me what you've done. Ask questions. Talk to me about the final project regularly. So that being said. Do we want to stop having class and just stay in the lab every day now? Do we want to talk some more in lecture? What do you want to do? Who has an opinion? Open lab hours. Open lab hours for the rest of the semester. Starting Monday? Really? Okay. The first... I mean, so there's a fairly common thing that happens and that is with a five-week project for the first week nobody does anything so if you're saying an open lab hour starting Monday I want to see people in there on Monday how about Wednesday then? <laughs> <laughs> we need to hunt the components to come so uh-huh okay so <laughs> I mean, I can see those <laughs> all right so what do y'all think? That's one opinion. What, any other opinions? Monday. Huh? Monday. You're going to be you're going to be working on Monday. So you're going to come in during I mean during you have at least a one hour time slot 
that I know you're not busy on Monday. And so, want to see some people there asking questions, digging around. Oh, yes, we have a whole cabinet, the, the right cabinet, the one that's always been locked. Turns out that the bottom two shelves is all surplus components. You can paw through to see what you can use. So, starting this afternoon, if you want. Um, the top two shelves are a little more organized. Much of that is surplus also. But if you take anything out of the cabinet, ask me, usually the price of anything out of that cabinet is zero. With a few, with a few exceptions. But, uh, you might want to dig through some of the old components and see what we got. There's a lot of 8-bit stuff. That's not going to be useful to you. But there's also radios, um, coin cell holders, all kinds of weird stuff. So what's it going to be? Monday? In lab on Monday. We all okay with that? Okay. It's been fun. So, video notes done. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go.